morning. Uh, welcome to this morning uh, session on uh, randomized and uh, approximation algorithms. To start the session, we're very happy to have Petros join us. Uh, Petros was uh, got his PhD from Yale in 2003, he got the career award in 2006, and until recently he was program director at NSF, in the information and intelligence systems and computing and communication foundations. Uh, he's done a lot of work in randomized and radical linear algebra. Uh, about randomization and approximation algorithms for all the algebraic uh, problems and applications to data mining. In particular, his applications have been to population genetics, return of data, and uh, climate search testing. So, this morning he's going to talk to us a lot about this. Thank you. Uh, so, thank you very much uh, for the introduction. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here, and um, today's session, I believe, is on randomized and approximation algorithms for. Uh, mining, extracting knowledge from massive data. And I'm going to start with uh, a linear algebraic approach for uh, such algorithms. And by that I mean that I'm going to describe randomized and approximation algorithms for uh, common matrix operations that you might want to do on large data sets. So why linear algebra? The answer is because a lot of data are naturally represented in uh, matrix form. <coughs> And the idea is that if you have uh, objects, they are described with respect to some features. And so a matrix is a natural, is a natural way to think of these objects. So the ij entry of the matrix would be the value of feature j, let's say, for object i. And let's say that recently, recently meaning in the last uh, half a dozen years or so, the data mining community has also been thinking about uh, representing <coughs> data as tensors Whereby a tensor, I just mean a multi-mode array. So a matrix is a two-mode, a two-dimensional array. A multi-mode, a multi-dimensional array would be, for example, representing a time-evolving data set, a time-evolving graph. And we saw some stuff on time series yesterday. And the data mining community has been thinking about uh, tensor-based ways of processing such data for quite a while now. The goal always is to learn some model from the underlying data. And we want to learn a model for the physical system that is generating the data. And the toolbox that I'm going to discuss is based on uh, linear algebraic operations and, in particular, matrix decompositions. And there are a lot of matrix decompositions. I'm going to talk about a few today. Singular value decomposition and the related principal component analysis is one of the most well-known ones. QR factorization, semi-discrete decomposition. I'm going to discuss the decomposition we introduced, the CX and the CUR factorization by decomposition. I'm going to discuss, I'm, I'm not going to discuss the non-negative matrix factorization, but this has also attracted quite a bit of attention over the past few years, and so on and so forth. And the idea of matrix decompositions is that they somehow use the relationships between the available data in order to say something about the underlying physical system, the components of the underlying physical system that is generating the data. They always make some assumptions about the relationships between the components of the physical system that is generating the data. And depending on whether you believe these assumptions or not, you should or should not use those decomposition. And it's a very active area of research. And some of these decompositions, the singular value decomposition, has been around for over a century. Uh, whereas others, LMF, CX, CUR, SDD, have been much more uh, recent. Why randomization? So randomization and sampling in general are resources. And we can use them to design provably accurate algorithms for either massive problems. Think of streaming data. Probably the only thing you can do is uh, keep a sketch of the data or a sample of the data in memory and work with that sketch. Or think of data where um, maybe they are not as massive as streaming data, so you can actually store them in disk. But you don't want to make too many passes over that data. Maybe you want to make a couple of sequential passes, keep a sketch, work with a sketch. Um, so randomization and sampling are natural tools to use in order to reduce the complexity of the data. Also, randomization and sampling, especially in theoretical computer science, have been resources to allow us to design provably accurate algorithms for problems that are computationally expensive or even MP hard. And those problems are difficult to solve even on small size inputs. And I'm going to discuss uh, such a problem. It's a combinatorial optimization problem in the context of linear algebra, the column subset selection problem. 
Even for medium-sized data sets, this is a difficult problem to solve. Let me show you, let me discuss actually how randomization has been used in the context of linear algebra over the past uh, decade or over the past uh, dozen years or so. Matrices consist of rows and columns or they can be thought of as consisting of just elements. So a very natural approach is to, instead of work with the whole matrix, keep a few rows or columns or keep a few elements. So what do you do? You basically take your matrix, you keep a few rows or columns, so you are creating a smaller matrix. That might be easier to store and work with. Or if you are keeping only elements, then you are basically sparsifying your matrix, and you are only working with this sparser matrix. So you keep those elements, you zero out everything else. How do you keep them? That's going to be important, and uh, it's not going to be uniformly at random or anything like that. We're going to want to do more elaborate things. And we're going to want to come up with sampling distributions which guarantee some very nice properties for your sketch, for your sample. It's always going to be our goal to argue that this sample, this sketch, a few columns, a few rows, a few columns and or rows, or a few elements, is close to the original matrix with respect to some matrix norm. And we're going to focus on unitarily invariant norms, not because they are the only norms out there, but because they are norms for which it's relatively easy to prove stuff. This is a sampling step, so there's going to be some failure probability here. Now, when we started working on this area, 1998, I'm going to use that as a starting point, uh, a work, a paper by Alan Fries, Ravik, and Samuels Vempala introduced the idea of sampling rows and columns. And back then, they said sample rows and columns with probabilities that depend on the Euclidean norms of the rows and the columns. So basically, rows and columns that contain larger elements, sample them with higher probability. And in 2006, Mutu, who is actually giving a talk tomorrow, Michael Mahon and myself, came up with another probability distribution, the leverage scores, which I'm going to discuss, which actually gives much better guarantees with respect to the <coughs> In between, in 2001, Dimitri Sakhlyopoulos and Frank Maxey came up with the idea of sampling elements, and they basically said, let's sample elements with probabilities that depend on the magnitude of the entries of the matrix. So sample larger elements with higher probability. And we'll see what this gives, and I'll have a bunch of open problems with respect to element-wise sampling at the very end. So that's in terms of sampling. An alternative idea came from Thomas Sarlos in 2006. And he said that if you pre-process the matrix, so if you are willing to, instead of sampling directly rows and columns from the matrix, just pre-process the matrix by using an idea that I will describe comes from random projections, then uniform sampling will actually do the trick because this pre-processing will make the matrix behave in a very uniform, very nice way. So this pre-processing idea gave the ability to do uniform sampling as opposed to biased, uh, careful sampling. Let me say that once you have your sample and once you have your proofs uh, for the distance, let's say, between the original matrix and the smaller matrix, then matrix perturbation theory allows us to say something about the singular values and the singular vectors of the original matrix and the sketch. And typically those spectral properties will be enough to prove a bunch of results uh, that we want in data mining and so on. I'll try to illustrate some of these applications today and show uh, the history here. There is an interplay. My training has been in theoretical computer science. That's where we get the idea of randomized and approximation algorithms from. It's a very common uh, thing there. Of course, we interact a lot with numerical linear algebra because we are doing linear, um, we are doing matrix computations. In particular, we borrow matrix perturbation theory, which is telling us how, for example, the spectral behavior of a matrix, singular values, singular vectors, are affected when you add noise. And I don't just care about proving theorems, I also work on applications. And in particular, I'm going to show one of those data mining applications that I've been working for about 10 years now on mining data from population genetics. And this is going to come right up because this is going to motivate me uh, to discuss some of the problems that arise. So let me describe the data. Population genetics, human genetics, um, you probably all have heard things like if we take our DNA, our DNA is 99% identical. 
well as the Thousand Genomes project is coming closer to completion and they're releasing more and more data, this 99% might be a bit, a bit of an overstatement, the number would probably be lower. But the bottom line is that, we, yes, we are very similar with respect to DNA, but of course there are differences between us. There are loci in the genome where we are different, and these loci account for things like, you know, maybe I'm a bit taller than average, at least for Greeks, um, my skin is perhaps a little bit darker, and um, you know, this might sound like um, a little bit perhaps less interesting, but of course the, the differences in DNA also account for susceptibility to diseases. Things like uh, diabetes, uh, types of cancer, heart diseases, and so on and so forth. And uh, one type of uh, genetic variation among humans is the so-called single nucleotide polymorphism. I'm not going to dwell too much into details, but there are a couple of things that I want you to remember. Single nucleotide polymorphisms appear throughout the genome, and of course we haven't really counted them, but there are probably a lot. There are about 10 million. Remember, the genome is about 3 billion bases, so about 10 million of those, again, an estimate, a common, uh, an often quoted number, 10 million of those correspond to single nucleotide polymorphisms. These are loci where, out of the four alleles, the four nucleotide bases, exactly two appear there. And what is happening, the kind of data that you get these days, is that people go and collect blood samples from individuals. They extract the DNA, they genotype them, they send them to a company like Illumina or Matrix, and this company genotypes them, not whole genome, just looks at those loci, at a lot of these SNPs, and gets back to you a matrix like that, which has rows being individuals, individual samples, and columns corresponding to these loci in the genome, the SNPs, and the entries here are genotypes. <coughs> genotypes, forget about exactly what that means, they are basically the bases that appear in that location. But what happens is that this matrix can be encoded entirely as 0, 1, and 2. There are basically three possibilities for every entry in this matrix. You can either be homozygotic in one allele, homozygotic on the other allele, or heterozygotic. Again, this boils down to a matrix of 0, 1, and 2. And that's arbitrary, by the way, it could be anything else. How big are those matrices? When I started working on this data 10 years ago, we were looking at hundreds of individuals, so there were hundreds of rows, and hundreds of SNPs. Today, we just uh, actually are genotyping a huge sample from uh, the southern Mediterranean, trying to understand the history of migration within that area. We are genotyping 5 million SNPs. So today, it is common in commercial platforms to have millions of columns in this matrix, many thousands of individuals. And uh, I'm going to show uh, publicly available data, actually, uh, for the purposes of this talk. And I found the following matrix. I took data from the Human Genome Diversity Panel, which is actually uh, an effort that started at Stanford by Luca Cavalli Sforza in the early 1990s. They gathered about a thousand samples, a thousand individuals from 50 different populations and seven geographic regions. And you can see the populations here. There are a few African populations, a few European populations, Middle East, uh, South Central Asia, East Asia, and then Native American populations and a couple of Native Oceanian populations. So the Human Genome Diversity Panel data, and um, every time they had a new release on their data, they typically publish in uh, uh, science. I combined them with data from another well-known project, the HAPMA project. Actually, these are phase three data. <coughs> another 1,200 samples, 11 populations, a few extra populations from Africa, a Gujarati Indian population, which was totally missing. India was totally missing from the Human Genome Diversity Panel. And interestingly, one of mixed population, the Mexican population, it's well known that the Mexican population has ancestry that is in between Europeans and Native Americans. <laughs> if you combine those two data, and again, these are publicly available. The Hama Project has published their uh, data and their releases in Nature for the past few years. Um, if you combine these data, you're going to get about 2,200 subjects. These are the rows in my matrix. And after quality control and so on and so forth, I'm looking at about 450,000 columns, the SNPs. 
So it's 2,200 rows, about 450,000 counts. This is a dense matrix, has over a trillion entries. And what I'm going to do on this matrix, I'm going to apply the singular value decomposition. Basically, the goal will be to identify principal components. So allow me to take a brief aside here and introduce the singular value decomposition and PCA in case you haven't seen it. SVD, it's a matrix decomposition. And for simplicity, I want to think of my matrix as containing M points in a two-dimensional Euclidean space, just so that I'm able to draw this in a nice way. So these are my points. The SVD will first find the direction of maximal variance in the data. So if you look at this data, it's probably not hard to see that they seem to be lying across a line here. This is what the SVD will identify, the direction of maximal variance in the data. Then once this has been found, it's going to say, OK, we understood that. So let's project the data on this direction and subtract the projection from the data. So this has been explained. Let's get rid of that. And then with whatever is left, the residual, we're going to find the direction of maximal variance for the residual. So then it's going to return the direction of maximal variance for the residual. It's not at all accidental that this, well, the aspect ratio is not right in the screen. This should be exactly what we're and that's because whatever has been explained by the first singular vector has been uh, removed from the data. And you are working on the direction of maximal variance of the residual, which is going to be perpendicular to the first one. We live in a two-dimensional space, so we are done. But in a high-dimensional space, it would be this greedy, iterative approach. Beyond singular vectors, this is what I basically showed. These are the top uh, right singular vectors of the data. The SVD also returns singular values. Singular values quantify the amount of variance that is captured by each principal component. And this is the reason why singular values decrease. So the largest one will be the first one, because that's the direction of maximum variance. The second one is the direction of maximum variance of the residuals. It's going to be smaller, and so on and so forth. And uh, let me just say that principal component analysis is basically the SVD of the covariance matrix after the mean centering. And typically, what we do is we keep a few of the top principal components, and we say that, well, uh, this is our model or something for the fiscal process that is generating the data. Let me give a formal definition as well. The SVD is breaking up the matrix as U. These are the left singular vectors. Sigma, this is a diagonal matrix of singular values. And V, this is a matrix of the right singular vectors. So that is formally what the SVD returns. U and V are orthogonal matrices. The column of U are pairwise orthogonal. The, the way I've stated it is as U sigma V transpose, so it's the rows of V transpose that are pairwise orthogonal. <coughs> How long does it take to compute the SVD? It's linear in the longer dimension, quadratic in the shorter. So it's the mean of mn square or m square n. And again, if you want to approximate the top Q, you can go for iterative methods, slums, and all the methods that leverage the trial of subspace to get a better approximation, to get a faster approximation. We're going to get back to some of these points later. Uh, the singular values are ordered from the largest to the smallest in sigma. So let's apply. Again, remember that my data are 2,500 subjects. With um, described with respect to 450,000 snips. Of course, one way to represent this matrix would be to just try and plot it in a 450,000 dimensional space. That's pretty hard. So, essentially, what the SVD is going to be doing, it's going to pick the top two left singular vectors of this matrix, and I'm just going to plot the data with respect to those top two left singular vectors. That's what the um, principal component analysis would basically be showing you, and this is the kind of picture you get. This is the first principal component. It's called Eigensnip. Lynn and Altman uh, called it like that in 2005, and the term is stuck. So this is the first principal component. This is the second principal component. There are 2,200 points here that I have plotted. And when geneticists see those pictures, they really like them. The reason being that you are getting nice sort of geography out of just genetic state. What are you looking at here? The African populations are right here. Middle East is here. <coughs> Europe, um, Central South Asia, Oceania, East Asia, and the Americas. The next comes are out of place. We'll see why in a minute. Before I say, uh, I want to show one more thing about this kind of picture. And here it is. Homo sapiens, our species, 
started somewhere in Africa, where exactly is an open question, moved in Middle East, and then branched out. One branch went towards Europe, the other branch went in Central South Asia, East Asia, crossed the Bering, eventually populated the Americas. That's about 20,000 years ago, we reached the Americas. Again, it's an estimate. Again, we don't know if that was the only path. Perhaps there were other paths. Uh, but this kind of figure also renders what geneticists sometimes call a visual support to this out of Africa hypothesis. Again, as I said, the Mexicans seem to be very out of place. Of course, they are out of place there. And the reason is that we are looking at two principal components. If we look at the third one, they end up exactly where they should be, in between the Americas, the Native American populations, and the European populations. And that's their, uh, basically the ancestry that uh, is commonly believed uh, for that the Mexicans have. Is this satisfactory? Well, there is an issue. The issue is what exactly are these axes? These are the left signal vectors. We understand them mathematically. They are perpendicular to each other. So this is all good. But in reality, they are linear combinations of all your available data, all your SNPs, all your features. So it's pretty hard to understand them. For example, you cannot genotype them. You cannot go to PubMed and search if there is information about them. A much better way to think of analyzing this data would be to have actual SNPs instead of these item SNPs. So this at least motivated me to think about the following question. Is it possible to get a subset of actual SNPs that capture the same information as the top 3 or k left singular vectors? And formally, that would mean that they would span the same subspace. So let's see the issues that arise. And let me start with uh, perhaps the more obvious one. Running time. I just gave you an SVD of a billion entries. It's a matrix that is 2,200 by 450,000 columns. Well, actually, you can compute it in a laptop. This laptop takes about 12 minutes to compute it using MATLAB. It's not a one line in MATLAB, at least. Because if you want to load this matrix, you're going to run out of memory. So you have to load it in pieces. Compute the eigen decomposition of AA transpose, and that's how you're going to do it. But it is doable, for sure. Well, this approach doesn't scale well. In a paper in Close One a few years back, we had to actually do about 1,200 SVDs of that size because one of the reviewers wanted a fully one out consolidation. That took a week in a cluster. It's still doable, but running time is a concern. We'd like to have fast methods to approximate the SVD. And we'd like to have efficient and easy to implement methods, methods that are basically easy black boxes for us. The second issue is what I already described, that instead of having principal components, instead of having those eigen SNPs, I'd like to have actual SNPs, actual columns from the matrix that capture the structure of the top few singular vectors. And this is a combinatorial optimization problem because I'm asking you to find the 10 columns, the 10 best columns that capture the same information as the top few singular vectors. And this is, of course, you can try all possible ones. That's a naive way to solve the problem. And the problem becomes hard. Certain formulations are actually known to be any hard. Let me say that it's a little bit worse. It's not even clear that such columns actually exist. So it's not clear, and certainly a few years back, I might even be tempted to say that the answer could be no, that there are a few columns where you, that you can pick and they will reproduce the structure of the uh, top few principal components. Of course, data sets like this one, as I said, increase in size. We are now pushing out a paper on an analysis that is twice as large as the one I showed. We have data from uh, 4,000 samples as opposed to 10, 2,000 genotyped on a little bit over uh, half a million SNPs. So they'll just keep increasing. So both issues will just keep becoming uh, more and more uh, computationally intensive to solve. However, these two questions are connected. And there do exist good columns in any matrix that contain information about the top principal component. If you can find those columns, you can get approximations of the top principal component. <coughs> But unfortunately, the statistic that I will describe, which is going to be called the leverage, which is the leverage course, and some of you might have seen them in statistics, is not easy to compute. In order to compute it, I actually need the SVD. So this doesn't immediately imply 
faster algorithms for approximating the similar value composition. But if I combine it actually with random projections, it will do that. And that's the story uh, that I'm going to discuss throughout the rest of the talk. So back to the similar value decomposition. The similar value decomposition breaks up a matrix A, S. Top K, let's say, approximates A, S. Top few left similar vectors times some matrix X. That's the similar value, the top K similar values times the top K right similar vector. Has strong optimality properties. It returns the best ranking approximation with respect to any unitary invariant norm. Um, the issue is that these left similar vectors are linear combinations of all your data, so it's a little bit hard typically to interpret them to understand what exactly they mean. What we proposed uh, with uh, Motu and Michael Maponi is a decomposition that instead of having left singular vectors here, has actual columns from the matrix. And I'm going to call that the CX factorization. Again, I'm approximating A by a few columns of A times something else, times a matrix X. The goal is that I want A minus CX to be small, so I want CX to be a good approximation to A. And of course, I want to do that without keeping too many columns of A. So I want C to be small. In particular, if I'm looking to approximate the top K principal component, I want C to be as close to K as possible. And uh, over the past year, basically, we have resolved this problem essentially over. And why do I care about this? And we had an article in PNAS in 2009 with Michael, where we were explaining why this is a good idea in data analysis. The reason I want this is because actual columns are easier to interpret. Actual SNPs, you can go to the literature, see if those SNPs, for example, are intragenic, what this particular gene is doing, and perhaps assign some interpretation. Let me clarify the problem a little bit more. You need to select columns, then you need to find X. Turns out, once you have the columns, finding X is very simple, at least if your goal is to minimize unitary invariant norms. And the reason is that this X can come from least squares problems. It even has a closed form solution. It's the pseudo inverse of C times A. The pseudo inverse of a matrix is just a generalization of the inverse to deal with uh, non square matrices or matrices that are potentially similar. So X is easy to find. The real issue is C. How do you find the representative columns in the matrix? This is the column subset selection problem. Find columns that capture the structure of the matrix. Certain variants are known to be anti-hard. Um, other variants, it's an open question of whether they are anti-hard, but most probably they seem to be different. Before describing leverage scores, I'm going to give you a statistic that solves this problem. But before describing that particular statistic, I'm going to actually describe a much simpler one, which comes from a couple of papers uh, back in 1998 and 1999. And the idea there is to, well, let's just pick columns with probability proportional to the Euclidean norm of the column. So what are you doing? You are biasing yourself towards columns that contain larger ends. What is that you do? You can create a smaller matrix. Do that, by the way, in um, S independent identical trials, just to make our life easier in terms of analysis. You're getting a CX factorization. Remember, this C plus A is just X. So you're getting A minus CX. With respect to the Frobenius norm, if you don't remember what the Frobenius norm is, it is the square root of the sum of the squares of the matrix. Of the matrix. So you're getting an expectation, and you can get high probability and all this nice stuff, but let me just describe the expectation. You're getting that A minus CX is less than or equal to the best possible. You are looking to approximate the best ranking approximation. You are never going to beat it. So this is the best possible plus something that scales as K over S. So as you increase S, you get better results. This is you increase your sample size, so you get better results, times the Frobenius norm of A squared. Let me show this pictorially uh, for a moment, and then I'll discuss if this is a good or a bad bound. So, this is your matrix. You sample 140 columns of this matrix and form a much smaller matrix, much smaller by a factor of 3. So, you sample about 140, it's smaller by a factor of 3, let's say. This is something with replacement, so you can't see it here, but duplicate rows, are, duplicate columns are allowed, that's not a problem. So, this is your sample. 
And I'm going to use this sample to compute Cx. And this is Cx. So this is A, this is your original matrix, this is Cx. If you look carefully, you're going to see that, of course, there are differences, especially around the eyes. The quality of reconstruction is not that good. But you get something, and uh, you can actually prove theoretically bounds for the Frobenius and the spectral norm of A minus Cx. And those are all um, described in the papers. I want to discuss whether this is a good bound or not. Trivially, first of all, if you set S to B equal to N, you don't get zero. That's because of sampling with replacement. This is not going to be a good uh, result, but this is the least of my concerns. The most important concern for me is that um, if the matrix A had run exactly K, then of course there exist K columns, so that A minus H would be exactly zero. So it would be K linear independent columns. And those columns would form an excellent basis with respect to which you could describe your whole matrix. This doesn't happen here. So this bound does not deal with the situation where k, where the matrix is run exactly k. I cannot fit k linear independent columns using this kind of values. What I would really want is that if they had numerical rank k, so it's not exactly rank k, but it's basically Rank K plus some residual. Then I would still be able to get a bound that instead of depending on the Frobenius norm of A here, depends on the Frobenius norm of A minus A sub K. That's what, within this context, we're going to call a relative error bound. Remember, A minus A K, the best K approximation, is the best we can do. So we want to approximate that. So we'd like a bound that scales proportional to this term here, not this term here. This is often called a negative error bound, as opposed to a relative error bound, where this AF square here would be A minus AKF square. <coughs> Interestingly, the same algorithm, just sample columns with respect to probability distribution, not the same probability distribution, in IIB trials, will give such a bound. So in 2008, we described this bound. Uh, this is the general version of the conference paper. What we said is that for any m by n matrix A, you can get k over epsilon square log k over epsilon columns from the matrix. So that a minus c x, this could be just x, a minus c x is less than or equal to 1 plus epsilon times the best you can do. So you get a relative error approximation to the best possible. You have a failure probability. Don't worry about the 0.9. This is just to make my life a bit simpler. You could have anything here and have a log 1 over delta factor here. The algorithm is the same as before. So this is the algorithm. Fix epsilon, fix C, the number of columns you are going to pick. Pick columns with probability proportional to that probability distribution. And keep the resulting matrix C. The only thing that changes, of course, is what this probability distribution is going to be. One thing that I did not discuss in the theorem is the running time. The algorithm, to the best of our knowledge, is proportional, takes time comparable to the SVD, order m and square. So this is not a faster a sub SVD algorithm at this point. It will actually use the SVD inside, but it can keep count that give you relative error approximation with respect to the CX factorization to the best possible. Let me discuss the probability distribution. UK, the left singular vector, sigma K, the top K singular values, DK transpose, that's the matrix, K by N, whose rows are basically the top K right singular vectors of the matrix N. Note that the rows of this matrix are pairwise orthogonal and they are normal, so the Euclidean norm is one, but the columns are not. For the columns of this matrix, the only thing you know is that the Euclidean norms go between zero and one. The Euclidean norms of the columns of this matrix are exactly the probability distribution that you want, as it turns out. So I use this notation here to denote the Euclidean norm, the sum of the squares, of the entries in each column of the K transpose, there are n such columns, so they correspond to the columns of A. They are basically showing you how each column of A behaves with respect to the top K left singular vectors. And that's the reason that this probability distribution, the Euclidean norms of the columns of the K transpose, 
reveals the information that you want. Columns that have large scores here correspond to columns that lie well within the subspace of the top k met singular vectors, which is what you are trying to approximate. We call this procedure subspace sampling. You give the stock long enough, and somebody tells you, well, we've seen this quantity before. It's called the leverage score. It's being used actually in statistics for outlier detection when you are doing linear regression. Well, if your goal is to approximate things like a singular value decomposition, find columns that are informative with respect to singular vectors and singular values, these are exactly the columns that you want to do because they influence the SVD disproportion. I want to show the leverage scores, and by the way, they are related to matrix coherence, another term that some of you probably uh, might have heard. Uh, basically, the leverage scores are the coherence of the matrix. In population genetics, I want to show what this leverage, how these leverage scores behave. And I took a subset of the data here. This is actually from a slightly older paper of ours. You are looking here at uh, maybe uh, about 500 samples, I believe from four continents, Africa, Europe, Asia, Americas. This is a raster plot. Remember, I said that the matrix, the SNP matrix, has three values, say 0, 1, and 2. Here, the zeros are, I believe, green. The twos are red. And black, which you can't really see, is uh, the 1. So this is a raster plot. And you had about, I think there are about 100,000 SNPs here. And these are the scores, the leverage scores of those SNPs. They are non-uniform. They are highly non-uniform. Actually, in many real data sets that I've looked at, the leverage scores are very non-uniform. So certain columns are quite informative with respect to BCA. Let's look how these uh, top 30, let's say, uh, SNPs behave, the SNPs that correspond to the top 30 leverage scores behave. And here they are. And you can see here that there are patterns that correspond to continents within those SNPs. For example, here is a pattern that seems to be fairly specific to the Americas. Here is a pattern that seems to be fairly specific for Africans. Here is a pattern that seems to be specific for the, Euro for, for the Europeans. The Asians don't have a pattern here, but if you run K-means on just those 30 SNPs, you can actually get at least continental signs. Why do we care about this? So we've been working with a number of companies that do ancestry prediction over the past few years. One of the reasons you care about this, and uh, at some point my colleagues had funding, they still have from the Department of Justice to do this, is that you get blood samples in a crime scene, and at the very least, you want to know the ethnicity of the individuals that have been involved there. You want to do it quickly with a small panel. You don't want to genotype 100,000 SNPs. So it's, it's getting cheaper and cheaper, but not faster. You want to do it with a small number of SNPs, say 20 or 30, in a lab, uh, and quickly get some answers. Um, let me say something about the recent development. This is a paper with uh, David Woodruff, Michael Mahoney, my colleague at RPI, Malik, Malcolm Ismail, uh, that will appear in ICML this year. But for certain cases, we know how to actually approximate the leverage scores fast. So the bottom of the algorithm I described is how to compute the leverage scores. Right now, I need the top KI singular vectors. And the only way I know how to get them accurately is basically through SDB. Uh, for certain special cases, we know how to do this faster. The general case is actually still open. The next question, in my mind at least, was, OK, with all the k over epsilon square, log k over epsilon counts, we are going to get, subject to a failure probability, this relative error bound. This is nice, but uh, the obvious lower bound is exactly k. So with exactly k counts, we can get something. And that something was answered by Amit Desfande and Louis Ray Marker in a paper in Fox 2010, who said that with exactly k columns, the bound you're going to get is going to be root k times the best possible. You're not going to be able to break that. What about the range between exactly k and order k log k? Is there something in between there? And we had a paper in Fox last year with uh, my former student, Christos Bucinis, and Malik, my colleague at RPI, uh, which said that you can actually get one plus epsilon approximations even by taking as few as 3k over epsilon counts. And uh, <coughs> simplicity is gone. I'm not going to even try to describe this particular algorithm uh, here. It combines our sampling strategies with a very nice result due to Dan Spielman and his students, uh, Nicholas Rivasta and Andrew Bachel. That was in stock 2009 on graphs classifiers. 
The runtime is pretty good. It's actually sub SVD, shorter M and K, basically. Uh, but uh, it depends on a greedy strategy, uh, on a, uh, which in practice we've not tried it yet. It's nice in theory, but it's not clear how well it's actually going to work uh, in practice. Let me say that uh, uh, a few months later, uh, in a paper in Soda 2012, um, Nikhil, uh, oh, sorry, uh, Alice Nop and uh, Venkat Gurjwami gave actually an asymptotically optimal algorithm. We had a constant that was uh, 3 in our previous result. The lower bound was exactly k over epsilon. They were able to match exactly this lower bound. So even up to constants, we now know exactly what is happening when you are sampling just calculus from the matrix. Again, this is theory in the sense that I don't know how they work in practice. They haven't been tried in practice on, for example, the genetics data at this point, but we will work in those subjects. And let me enter the last part of the talk in the last 10 minutes. Let me discuss how to make some of these things faster. So, so far I said leverage scores, great. You can definitely compute them by computing the SVD. You can select informative calculus. How can you do it faster so that you can actually approximate the SVD part? So this is going to be the second part of the, the goal of the last part of the talk. To understand this, I need to digress a little and discuss random projection. And this has been extremely popular in theoretical computer science. The so-called Johnson and the Strauss lemma, uh, uh, invented, described, proven by Johnson and Linda Strauss in 1984. The idea of this lemma is the following. You are given a set of n points in Rn, and you are given some accuracy parameter s. You can map those points to a lower dimensional space. The dimensionality of this lower dimensional space will be order log m over epsilon squared. Does not depend on the dimensionality of the original space at all. It only depends on the logarithm of the available number of points. And what are you doing? You are preserving norms. This is the map point, and its Euclidean norm is going to be a good approximation, a relative error approximation, to the norm of the original point with high probability. So you take your original space, you map it down to a lower dimensional space, and you preserve norms. And notice that in this projection, the dimensionality of the original space does not play a role. How do you do the map? Think of the original data set as an m by n matrix set, n points in an n-dimensional space. Think of the projected data as an m by s matrix. So n points, but now in an s-dimensional space. The projection, the mapping, is basically a matrix-matrix product. So this matrix R here, which is n by s, that's the projection. So a is n by n, this is n by s, it gets you an n by s matrix map. In the original paper by Johnson and Wittenstrauss, the idea was that you use as matrix R a random k-dimensional orthogonal matrix. Since then, people have thought a lot about other possible constructions for this random projection matrix R, in particular because we'd like to make this random projection fast, faster than just a matrix-matrix product. So this matrix product, we'd like to compute AR quite fast. Let's see how you can do this. First of all, let me say that one of the most popular ways of constructing the matrix R is, is uh, to just use uh, normal 0, 1, i, i, d variables. So just set the entries of R to be normal 0, 1 variables, independent, uh, independent of each other. Dimitris Arkadas in 2003 proposed a fairly bold, at least for that time, uh, construction. And the idea was set R to be plus 1, forget about the scaling, plus 1 with probability 6, minus 1 with probability 6, 0 with the main probability. So many of the entries of this matrix in expectation will be zeros. Why? Because in that case, this matrix-matrix product will be fast. The more zeros you have, the faster matrix-matrix multiplication is going to be. However, if you try to push this further down, the result breaks. Because if your original vectors, their energy is very concentrated, you're not going to be able to preserve their norms with just a sparse random projection. So even though those numbers are a little bit arbitrary and you could push them down, you cannot push them down enough 
to make the matrix matrix product really fast. And this was the situation until 2006, when uh, Mir Island and Bernard Sozel came up with a very nice idea. The idea was to use this product PhD as the matrix up. And I'm going to describe this matrix, matrices in reverse order. Let me start with D. D is an n by n matrix, very simple, diagonal, plus minus one with probability half. So that's it. Very simple matrix, diagonal, plus minus one with probability half. H is a well known matrix. It's the Hadamard Walsh transform matrix. If you don't remember what it is, don't worry about it. But it's, there is one complication. It has to be, it's only defined when n is a power of two. Well, you can always get around this simply by padding your original data with all zeros at the end, so that's an easy way to get around it. P is a very sparse matrix. I'm actually using the construction of Matusek, came up in the same year as uh, uh, Bernard Suzel's and Neil Island's fast notion of fast transform. And P is a matrix that is again plus, minus, one, and zeros, but now most of the entries are really zero. So the probability that an entry is non zero is going to be just log square m over n. And if you do the math here, in expectation p, we'll have a polylogarithmic in n, non zero number of n. So it's going to be a very, very sparse matrix. What saves the day? What saves the day is this product h times d, which basically spreads out the energy of the input. It makes sure that no matter what your input vectors were, even if they were concentrated on one of the coordinates, pre-multiplied by H and D, which is often called the randomized Hadamard transform, <laughs> spreads them out. If they are spread out, a sparse matrix will actually preserve knowledge. Now, the real nice property of this transform is that it can be applied very fast on the day. Why? Because to apply this random, this random projection on a point, on a point u in Rn, all you need to do is multiply u by d. And that's a diagonal matrix, so that takes all their time. Then you need to multiply h by du. And now, this is not matrix vector multiplication. Normally, it would take all their square time. But because of the structure of the hadamard walsh matrix, this is a very nice matrix, basically the real part of the Fourier transform. So you can use FFT type algorithms, the hadamard walsh algorithm in particular, to do that much faster, in order n long n time, as opposed to order n square. And then p is very sparse. It has basically order log u then non zero n. So it's very fast to apply this on the resulting vector. So the overall multiplication takes considerably less time than the order n square time, at least again um, theoretically, but also in practice, these things have been implemented and they work fairly well. Um, keep in mind that other transforms have also been tried, the discrete cosine transform as opposed to the hadron walsh transform, and so on, and there are results on all these things, which I'm not going to point, but I'm happy to discuss offline if you're interested. Back to approximating singular vectors. How does it connect to approximating singular vectors? Imagine that this is your input matrix. A, whose singular value the composition is U sigma V transpose. <coughs> Post multiply this matrix by the randomized Hadamard transform, basically just the matrices D and H. What do you get? You get this product, U sigma V transpose D H. This matrix, both these matrices here are actually orthogonal. So A D H does not change the left singular vectors of A. So A D H and A have the same left singular vectors. What did you gain? Turns out this post-multiplication by DH uniformizes, makes the leverage scores uniform. Up to the factors, but that's for the analysis. So you started with a matrix A whose leverage scores were not uniform, you have no idea what they were. You post-multiplied by the randomized Hadamard transform, and now the leverage scores became uniform. So now you can basically do uniform sampling there. And that sample, the sample of columns you are going to get, contains very good approximations to the left singular vectors of the original matrix. And that's the strategy to approximate the singular vectors. You start with A, you post multiply by D and H, you take a uniform sample of your columns, and you use that sample to approximate the singular vectors and singular values of the original matrix. 
This has all the nice properties. You can prove that uh, this sample contains uh, relative error approximations to singular, the top singular values and the top singular vectors. I'm not going to worry about the exact form of the theorem. You need slightly more columns. You need a number of columns that is polylogarithmic in N to account for the fact that the leverage scores are uniform up to log in N, up to log N factors. The running time is very good. It turns out that you are looking at order MN times polylogarithmic in N running time. You get good approximation to um, the left singular vector, the left singular vectors and the singular values of the vector. And I think it's time for me. So what's the discussion? Randomization and sampling can be used to solve problems that are massive and or computationally expensive. This is the way this has been mostly used in computer science. If you carefully sample with respect to, say, leverage scores, rows and columns from a matrix, we can construct a new sparse smaller matrix that behaves similarly to the original matrix. What about entries? This is going to be the open problem that I'm going to discuss in my next slide. By reprocessing the matrix using random projections, you can now be careless with respect to sample. You can sample uniformly at random and still get nice behavior. So these were the conclusions with respect to sampling rows and columns. What about elements? The question of whether entry-wise sampling can be made competitive to row and column sampling, to the best of my knowledge, is still open. What do we know? Dimitri Sakhlevas and Frank Maxeri in Stock in 2001, they said that if you sample elements with probabilities that are proportional to the entries, the magnitude, sorry, the magnitude of the entries in the matrix, you're going to get some error bounds. And these error bounds are very similar to the additive error bounds that I described earlier on. To the naive bounds, if you want, that we got when we were sampling columns and rows with probability proportional to the Euclidean norm. Can you do better? And by the way, this has been generalized with tensors. Uh, we have a slightly better bound recently with Tarsus Uzias, but still it's another developer bound. Can you do better? Well, uh, Terry Tao, Emmanuel Candes, um, um, Ben Reck have worked on the problem from a slightly different angle, where you, they said that what if you pick a uniform sample of entries from a matrix under assumptions? And the assumptions were that, first of all, the matrix has fixed rank, constant rank, small. And second, that the matrix has bounded coherence. Basically, that the human, that the level of scores that behave fairly uniform. And the question was that in that case, you can actually use trace minimization methods, which is the convex relaxation of uh, rank minimization, to get exactly constructions, which is a relative error bound. So you get exactly construction under certain assumptions from a uniform sample. The question that I think still remains open is what is an element-wise probability distribution? So that if you sample a small number of elements from a matrix without any assumptions of the matrix, can we still get one plus epsilon approximations to the best rank approximation? Similar to what we've done for columns and rows. And I think this is going to be probably fundamentally more difficult. You preserve a low construction when you're sampling columns and rows as opposed to when you're sampling elements. And I believe with this open question, I'm going to thank you and Leave it for all the It's a very interesting talk. Uh, I have a question. All the, the columns are completely independent uh, in that case. If uh, we consider that uh, the columns are uh, time series, if there is an order, uh, is there an interest to uh, take into account this order? And are there any uh, results, uh, for, for instance, for sampling the columns in that case? Yeah, but that's, a, that's a good point. SVD and all these, the compositions, do not assume any order of the counts. They are actually independent of the order of the counts. You can get exactly the same singular bars and same singular vectors if you permute your matrix. Um, the only way I know that people have been thinking about time series type data is modeling them as tensions. <coughs> so somehow taking every column, modeling that as a matrix, and having 
a separate mode uh, to deal with it. So the answer is no, with these methods I have no idea how to uh, take into account the ordering of the counter. Um, so the, all these processes that you've been describing seem in a sense to be sort of anti-robust in that they're particularly interested in the largest magnitude entries that you can outline. So I'm wondering if you see any way of uh, combining any of this with uh, robustness uh, techniques or algorithms or whether they're sort of mutually exclusive. Yeah, so that's a very good point. Uh, clearly, L2 regression is well known not to be robust. You want things like L1 regression to be robust. I don't know of an L1 analog of PSVD, and there have been attempts over the years. Uh, some of the techniques I described generalize to L2 regression. So you could use some of those techniques, not the Hadamard transform, but you could use things like the Fossi transform to do L1 regression, approximate L1 regression, um, and there has been work there. Um, the short answer is that um, we are looking at uh, L2 from Binion's norms and all these things as opposed to robust equivalents like infinity norms, for example, just because these are simpler proofs. And in certain applications, they are okay. For example, for genetics, it looks like they are relevant because principal cause analysis and density already works. If robust regression, for example, is what you should be looking at, then these norms are not <coughs> the right uh, point to start. I have kind of a meta question. I mean, the, the optimization problem that the SVD solves and that you're solving by representation of columns is to reproduce the matrix well in L2. And, but it's being applied to classification problems where the goal isn't somehow to reproduce the data, it's to separate the classes. And it's all very mysterious to me why things empirically seem to spread out well in the SVD transform and why one couldn't do better by posing a different optimization problem that sort of takes into account within versus between variation in the groups. So what you really like to do is find a sparse representation that separates the groups, not a sparse representation that reproduces the original data. Yeah, this is a very good point, and let me just clarify, everything I've discussed here is unsupervised. So, Everything I've said, population genetics, the basis we've been looking at, for those methods, we're talking about unsupervised methods. So we're not looking at classification. For example, it's not obvious to me at all either why SVD would preserve the relevant dimension for classification. And let me give an example. Population genetics data are not just used in this unsupervised manner. They are also used in a supervised manner where you want to identify SNPs, counts in your matrix, that are responsible for indices. So you take cases and Controls, and you want to figure out which of the SNPs is perhaps correlated with this affection status. And there, SVD does not separate at all cases from controls because it cannot become that simple. So I agree with your question. I think it's a very relevant question. And for supervised cases where you want to, for example, use them for SVMs, I don't think these are the appropriate uh, methods, this type of dimensional deduction. This will only work when unsupervised methods already work, when your signal is dominant. To get a bit trendier, let's say my matrix is a graph of a social network or some other sort of sparse data. Your motivating example here was the <coughs> dense matrices. How would you want to modify what you're saying or change what you're saying or to take advantage of sparsity in some other data sources? So let me just say that sparsity actually is a big issue. One thing that I have not touched today, and um, it's actually a very active area of research, is how to solve sparse systems of linear equations using methods like this. And these techniques right now don't deal with the sparse. Because anytime you do random projections, you're going to densify your output. And uh, I think the short answer is that I could say something for Laplace of graphs using a very different set of techniques invented by Dan Spillman and Gary Miller and his students. And we should take this discussion <coughs> offline because it's a long discussion. Um, for sparse Laplacians, I might be able to say something in terms of doing things more efficiently. For arbitrary sparse matrices, I don't know much. Sparse Laplacians are basically matrices that correspond to graphs. So for that, maybe we'd be able to preserve sparsity. In general, these techniques don't preserve sparsity. So they don't really do that. 
Yeah, so linear regression is actually, we had a paper in new month last year, uh, we have relative error approximations for over or under constraint linear regression, which is the more interesting case, otherwise you're getting very close to systems of linear equations. So linear regression, I want to think of it as either having many points, a small number of features, or a small number of points and a large number of features, you can get relative error approximations using those techniques, so that is known. The case where the matrix that you do regression on is more square, you're getting closer to linear equations. That's a line of work uh, by Dan Spielman and Gary Miller. We know how to do those things very efficiently for Laplacian matrix. For general matrix, it's still a big open problem if those techniques can help. Uh, the second question is, uh, what about the idea of using these, you know, for people who still want many digits of accuracy in their linear algebra, what, what about using this stuff as a Right, right. So using them as precondition, it gets very close to the question of solving uh, linear regression or systems of linear equations with those. And there is work by Chaim Avro and Sivan Tolindo. It's called the Blended Bit. It's Blended Bit software package where they've actually implemented this. They're claiming they claim it works very well. It scales with the logarithm of one over epsilon. So for every extra digit of accuracy, you need one extra iteration, basically. Uh, Michael Mahoney, Michael Saunders, and one of their students, whose name I forget for a minute, um, have done an implementation in uh, Amazon's Elastic Cloud also, so something that scales to massive data, hopefully, and they have an article in archive, I'm more than happy to point you to those if you want. So there are some implementations out there, of course, where it's still a bit there. Sorry, I have a couple of questions. One is about entry-wise sampling, is it the one advantage of any entry-wise sampling is that you more that you have more robust and sometimes you add like, what you think about lowering for the profits, the other question is more theoretical, is Choice of, um, of norms. And we worked a lot in Greenish Norway, but about top variable <coughs> angle information in EDP. And the Greenish norm can be large, but whereas a top variable norm is small, and then we have those information. So I didn't show bounds on the operator norms, we have bounds there, but we don't have our bounds for other norms, infinity norms, L1 norms, or matrices. So anything non unitary is very, we don't have bounds for. Trace norm, for example, we don't have bounds for, but I think we can get bounds for that as well. Uh, there was little motivation at that point, but everything I've said, there are also bounds for the spectral norm as well. Not relative error bounds for the spectral norm, and such bounds probably do not exist. I think we might even have lower bounds there. In terms of element wise sampling, the, the concern, in my mind at least, is that element wise sampling right now, um, you cannot get relative error accuracy by sampling the probably proportion of the magnitude of the image. You need something deeper than that, something that decorrelates the image. And there are certain candidates, I just haven't seen anything that says. And if you sample from a broader distribution, you're going to get very good accuracy for similar metrics of the time. But I agree that certainly in practice seems to be pretty well. Thank you very much. So this, uh, thanks very much, Petros. <laughs>